Good morning, everyone. Or actually, I guess it's now afternoon since it's uh, 12 p.m. here, at least Eastern time. And it's late afternoon, uh, if there's anybody viewing from Europe, and I guess it's still morning in the uh, rest of the United States. But uh, uh, I'm Eric Hurst here with Training Cafe, episode number 71. Uh, the Training Cafe is something that I started doing uh, back in the early days of COVID when we were all locked down at home. I guess it would have been, what, three years ago, about this time, uh, March. And uh, there wasn't much to do other than work at home for, for many of us at that time or, or exercise outside. And um, so the Training Cafe was born, and I was doing these during COVID, during the lockdown, every week just to kind of keep busy and engaged. Uh, and I got tremendous feedback. And so I've decided to continue on post-COVID, uh, doing these once or twice a month. Uh, lately, it's been more like once a month because I've been uh, busy, and the time is flying by, and I've got many balls in the air, like I'm sure you guys do too, trying to train and climb and family life and work life. And uh, so, uh, but I'm committed to this. I really enjoy uh, interacting with climbers at the gym, at the crag, and, you know, through my podcasts and videos, it's a way for me to interact with folks uh, internationally. And so uh, this training cafe, I'm going to talk for 10 or 15 minutes about the topic of the day, which is making the transition from being a, kind of a gym climber training during the winter season to being uh, an outdoor climber trying to perform during the spring, summer, even into fall season. And how do you make that transition? What things should you be focusing on, thinking about during this transition period, uh, which I'm going through right now. I'm on my first brief outdoor climbing trip of the season uh, at the Red River Gorge, where unfortunately the weather hasn't been great. It's been a lot of wet days. Uh, it was warm the first few days. Now it's like 35 degrees with a light rain snow mix here. And so uh, this is not a climbing day for me. My fingers don't tolerate the cold very well. And, uh, you know, hopefully there'll be some warmer weather uh, coming in the next few days. Uh, but, you know, I'm trying to make that transition from winter training uh, into the spring season. So I'll share some of my uh, strategies and give you some clues on what you should be thinking about and doing to hopefully climb your best here in the coming weeks. Uh, and then uh, towards the end of this uh, live stream, I'll answer some of your training questions. I see somebody already typed in a question into the comments box. So if you have a brief question, training, technique, mental, nutrition, injury, Go for it, type it in. I'll try to uh, give you a brief, um, meaningful answer here uh, later on in this episode. Uh, of course, every training cafe we begin with coffee or the beverage of your choice. And we raise our glasses together because one of the things I love about climbing is it brings people together. Despite the diverse backgrounds, uh, you know, where you're at, your religion, politics, age, gender, you name it. Uh, climbers, we're a tribe uh, that unite. And uh, we have the shared passion that brings people together. It's a beautiful thing. And, uh, you know, the more people we have climbing in the world, I think the better the world is. So, uh, you know, I'm a big advocate of growing this sport. Uh, I've been at it for 40, over 46 years, believe it or not. And so uh, to see the sport grow as it has during my lifetime is wonderful. And let's keep it going in a very positive way. So raise your cup. Let's sip together. Ah, I'm still drinking coffee. I started at about 6 a.m. Still going at noontime. <laughs> um, so uh, with that out of the way, uh, I also in many episodes give a shout out to a climber or some success story that I've heard. Maybe it's a pro climber. Uh, in this case, it's my older son, Cameron, uh, who um, in the past month has sent three 514D, that is 9A plus in European grades, uh, to uh, do that many hard routes in a short period of time uh, is a rare feat unless you're named Andra or Megos or you know, I have one of those huge names. And uh, Cameron is just a 22-year-old uh, college student. 
um, you know, and semi-pro climber, I guess you might say. And so he trains hard and uh, he's out from under my roof and uh, on his own for the most part. Uh, and it's fun to see him still be passionate about climbing and uh, pushing hard at the crags. And uh, he's starting to actually get into doing some training himself in terms of coaching. Uh, you know, he is studying exercise science in college. Uh, he grew up in my house training, you know, uh, with my guidance uh, all those years. So he's got a lot of wisdom for a 22 year old. And, uh, you know, you can, um, if you're a young climber or a young adult climber in, uh, you know, Utah or elsewhere, uh, you know, you could check out CameronHurst.com and you could engage Cameron uh, for some uh, coaching advice or engagement if you like. Uh, okay, so let's get on to this episode. And uh, by the way, hopefully my audio is a little better this time around. I know last episode I had a few people tell me the audio was um, not, not loud enough. So I've tried to get things fixed up here this time around. And uh, hopefully you can hear me better. And uh, the live stream is solid uh, this time around. Okay, so um, main topic of the day, that transition from gym to crag. Now, you know, there are some folks, not me, who climb all winter long. You know, the boulderers who are out in their down coats and, you know, uh, warming their hands over a, a, a gas stove uh, in between bouldering attempts. And I get that, you know, that is, you know, perhaps optimal bouldering conditions, but that's not me. Uh, at all. Uh, I'm an indoor climber and kind of, uh, you know, a sport climber for the most part uh, when the weather gets a little warmer, a little nicer. And uh, um, so for me, and if you're like me, you know, the winter's more about getting strong. Uh, maybe if you came out of the previous season with some aches and pains, getting those healed uh, and hopefully setting yourself up for success the following season. Uh, for me, I had a little bit of a knuckle injury I mentioned, and not, not so much injury, it's old guy stuff, you know, arthritis in my knuckle. So that kind of prevented me this winter from doing a couple of things. Uh, I couldn't do any real small crimp training, like no eight millimeter or six millimeter crimp edge hangs, which is something I do a little bit of training of. Normally, I didn't do any of that because it provoked this arthritic knuckle. Uh, and also, I had to kind of keep my volume lower than I like. And, and I'm, a, 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 a route, as a route climber, someone who does a higher volume of training. I do a lot of two-a-day workouts. I do a lot of sub-maximal climbing on the tread wall or at the gym on routes where I don't pump out, where I don't fail, that uh, focus on aerobic system development because that really pays off when you're route climbing, especially steep routes where the aerobic energy system is contributing more to ATP production than the anaerobic system is. Uh, and I couldn't do as much volume training this winter uh, because, again, the volume was kind of, you know, is an accumulated stress on an achy joint or injury. Uh, and so I'm coming into spring season, unfortunately, not in the shape I had hoped I would be in. Uh, and I've done a few, you know, fairly difficult climbs here at the Red um, in the past week. Uh, you know, a um, handful of 12 plus kind of routes, did one 13A route, uh, but I'm looking to project 13B, 13C, um, and I didn't even get on anything because I'm not in the shape to really put much effort in. And actually I did, I got on Kaleidoscope and gave it a couple practice goes. Um, that's hopefully something I can set up for fall season, uh, begin to learn the moves now, but I'm not in the shape to send something like Kaleidoscope, which is uh, an 8A plus, uh, not at this time, unfortunately. Um, so, you know, I was kind of coming out of that winter season, um, you know, a uh, little heavier, you know, um, not quite as strong. You know, my strength to weight ratio is not where I would like it to be. Uh, you know, I often, like many athletes do, many pro athletes do, or professional athletes off season will train a little heavier, eat a bit more, um, you know, making sure that as they're training hard, they're getting enough protein, enough fuel to, to get the adaptations and, and not get injured. Uh, but then you come out of your off season a little heavy, you know, maybe three to six pounds heavy. You, you know, if you're in a strength to weight ratio sport, you know, whether it's, you know, running uh, or it could be boxing, MMA, 
uh, rock climbing, gymnastics. You know, I mean, there's a lot of strength to weight ratio sports where, you know, during the off season, you can be and train heavy, but then during the on season, you need to optimize your weight, not starve yourself. Definitely not. You know, that's not productive. It'll get you injured, sick, and make you miserable. <laughs> but optimizing your weight, that's what professional athletes do. And anybody who says they don't is lying. Uh, and that includes rock climbers, you know, that will tend to try to, through a combination of training and uh, dietary surveillance, uh, you know, get their weight optimized. So for me, my fighting weight, if you want to call it that, is uh, more like 160, 162, and right now I'm kind of like 168. And so that six to eight pounds is huge uh, when you're getting on a steep route or hanging on a tiny edge. Uh, bouldering is a little more forgiving, route climbing less so because you gotta carry all that extra weight up a very long distance. Uh, and so uh, that's something hopefully in the coming weeks through a combination of running, dietary surveillance, and being able to ramp up my climbing volume, I can uh, dial those things in. So for me, the transition here early on is just getting back on rock, you know, climbing real rock, um, even though it's the same muscles and generally the same movement patterns as gym climbing, uh, the fine motor control and just the nuance is much different from the gym. You know, the playing field is truly infinite when you go outside in terms of the holds, shape, and varieties. Whereas in the gym, you know, the holds and shapes tend to all be similar and the movement patterns repetitive uh, and there's just less novelty indoors. And so despite how much gym climbing you do, you have to go outside and get volume in. Uh, and so that would be my first suggestion is as you venture outside, as tempting as it might be to go straight to your project, it, it might actually be better to go and spend a few days uh, or a couple of weeks of climbing where you're just kind of climbing for volume a little below your limit. Um, maybe dabble on a project, but not get so focused that that's all you do initially when you go outside and instead accumulate um, some sends, kind of as I have done, you know, this week at the Red, uh, you, you know, uh, I think I've climbed a half a dozen or more routes between 12A and 12D quickly. You know, uh, some of them on site, some of them second go, uh, and again climbing for volume and and doing you know a lot of warm up type climbing as well on 510s and 511s. Kind of just getting that smooth movement back, um, learning how to move quickly, learning how to rest on outdoor routes. Those are all things that you don't do. You know, indoor climbing doesn't mimic so well. Uh, and so investing early, early season, those first few trips or first few days outside into climbing for volume to kind of get your groove back, I think is a good thing. And then uh, jump on the project as you kind of get that outdoor movement and fitness and mind game dialed back in. And so for me, I would like to hope that my spring season kind of crescendos uh, to sending some harder routes, you know, 13A, 13B, uh, uh, you know, hopefully several uh, routes of that grade as I get into, you know, mid to late April or May. Um, and then, you know, hopefully if I can have a good spring and summer season, that sets me up for, you know, typically I try to peak in the autumn season, as many people do, uh, you know, especially here in the east, October into November is often the best climbing condition. So, I'm kind of planning always three to six months down the road. And so um, I would encourage you to kind of do the same. The more you can map out the future, the better. Um, a few more things. Um, if you've been training really hard, you know, intensively uh, for the past two or three months, you would probably benefit from a bit of a taper before your first outdoor climbing trip. So if you have a trip, a weekend trip, or longer planned, take a one-week taper. Don't train up till two days before the trip. You know, you can't cram when it comes to training. So there's a lot of benefit to, you know, that last week before your first big trip, uh, letting yourself taper. Keep the intensity high, but reduce the volume of climbing uh, that final week, and then give yourself two full days of rest, maybe even three, in, up into your first climbing day. Um, 
If you've been doing a lot of weightlifting during the winter season, which I'm an advocate of limited weightlifting, uh, but this is not a sport where putting on 10 or 20 pounds of muscle is going to help you, especially if it's in the lower body, it's going to hold you back, you know? And so if you've been doing a lot of weightlifting, I would cease it completely, uh, except in rehab situations. If you have a shoulder or some other body part that you need weights to rehab, continue that. If you've been doing, you know, some of the rudimentary lifts, you know, like bench press and deadlift and squatting and shoulder press, I would cease that completely during climbing season. Uh, you, you don't, um, well, first of all, you know, when you lift heavy weights, especially if you're doing, you know, in the rep range more than about six reps, uh, it's a signal for hypertrophy. It's a signal for storing more glycogen in those lifting muscles, which if you're squatting and deadlifting, your lower body are not muscle groups that you want to store glycogen in, um, unless you're going to run 10 miles or hike a big mountain. But if you're going to go bouldering or sport climbing, you don't need huge glycogen stores in your legs. Uh, you know, the fact is the slow twitch fibers are what are powering you most of the time when you're climbing. And th that is fueled by fatty acids circulating and what little, uh, glucose and lactate circulate systemically is plenty for your legs. So to, to lift heavy weights and store glycogen and hypertrophy, your, your quad muscles, let's say, which are the biggest muscles in your body, your quads and glutes, you can, you can easily add two, three, four, five pounds of weight there by lifting during climbing season. And that would be a real stupid thing to do. Um, so you do some lifting during the off season to build some strength to build some connective tissue strength, to make your nervous system stronger. Those things will carry through even after you quit lifting. You know, you can take three to six months off and not do any serious lifting. And that would be a smart thing for most rock climbers heading into the on season. And just by eliminating the weightlifting, you'll drop a few pounds of, of weight in, in a, a few weeks. That can be a real difference maker if you're trying to climb at your limit especially on overhanging routes. Um, and of course, dialing in your diet, you know, that is part of the formula as well. Again, not depriving yourself ever of carbohydrates or protein. You know, pr the average climber should be getting, I believe, at least 80 grams of protein a day and probably more like 100 to 120 if you're a normal size uh, man, uh, you know, training hard. You need it to not only rebuild muscles, but also connective tissues, which are made of protein and water. That's about it. So if you're deprived of protein, you're slowing down recovery and remodeling of both muscle and connective tissues and potentially setting yourself up for injury. Um, and if you're trying to keep your calorie count down while still getting the protein, that's where protein supplements can be really helpful, like collagen before you exercise and whey protein after you exercise or before bed. Uh, and again, I mentioned the, um, the value of having a plan, you know, three to six months down the road, kind of, you know, if you can make a blueprint for when your trips are going to be, you know, maybe not every single day you're going to be outside or every single weekend, but, you know, what are the, you know, like Memorial weekend or Easter weekend when, when a lot of people travel for longer spells than just two days. Know when those trips are, know how you can, Get yourself to kind of peak for those little trips. Uh, maybe there's a summer period, July, where it's very hot and humid where you live and you won't be climbing outside at all. And you can do a mini training block during the summer season. So you can kind of plan for that and then, you know, set yourself up to, to peak again for a fall season. Okay, so I guess that's about it for my advice on transitioning into the outdoor climbing season. I hope you found that of some value. Uh, I do see some questions typed in here, so let's get to them here, and um, I'm going to try to wrap this episode up in another uh, 15 minutes or so. Uh, first question uh, is, um, he says, for some endurance training, I do intervals on an overhanging spray wall. The protocol is three minutes on, three minutes off. How many sets are enough? I wonder, five sets or if more would be better, uh, or would that create more fatigue? 
And uh, as I often begin my answers to questions, it depends. And in this case, what it depends on is how hard those three-minute intervals are. Because if you are, if that three-minute spray wall interval is all out, in other words, you're on there climbing as hard of moves as you can and grabbing the smallest holds and doing the biggest moves and you know, you're shaking out just enough to hang on through the burn, through the pump, to make it to three minutes. And then you basically fail at three minutes or, or around three minutes. If, if it's exhaustive all out, that protocol will um, almost totally drain your anaerobic reserve. You know, the first minute of all-out climbing is more anaerobic than it is aerobic. The next minute or two is kind of this crossover where the anaerobic system is failing and the aerobic system is taking over and your power is dropping off rapidly. Um, and by three minutes of all-out climbing, as I just described, you've basically drained the anaerobic system, uh, that anaerobic reserve, and you're you know, your pH, you know, the acidosis in the hard-working muscles has lowered the pH. Uh, it starts just to mess up the uh, enzymes. Uh, you know, the brain is getting all these signals, feedback, saying, you know, we're doing damage, and the brain shuts down recruitment. And all you're left with is slow-twitch fibers and the aerobic energy system to carry you on at a much lower intensity. Uh, and so that protocol exhausts the aerobic energy system, it makes your forearms quite acidic, uh, and that is not something you want to do repeatedly, like for, for many, many sets. And if you're doing that type of high intensity, uh, three minute all out burn, which I would call more of an anaerobic lactic exhaustive uh, protocol, I would rest more like nine minutes, so more like a one to three ratio or even one to four ratio. So if you're climbing three minutes exhaustively, rest nine or 12 minutes and do only about four of those. And any more than that uh, will be counterproductive. Now, the other side of the, the depends coin is if you're doing those three minute spray wall endurance burns at a submaximal intensity. Uh, if the intensity is kind of seven or eight out of 10, where you always have a big hold nearby and you can shake out, and yes, you're getting pumped, but it's never that sick pump. You're never at the point of, you know, powering out or pumping out, um, you know, that what I, call, you know, climbing through the pump. Uh, and again, it, it, it can't be nine out of 10 effort or intensity. It's got to be more like six, seven, eight out of 10. And so with that submaximal level of climbing for three minutes, yeah, the anaerobic system is getting recruited, no doubt about it. You're generating lactate, you're generating hydrogen ions, but not so ex excessively that that anaerobic system causes this systemic failure and you know the brain shutting you down and you powering out. But instead, there's enough circulation, enough aerobic system involvement to make ATP, enough blood flow to uh, circulate lactate and hydrogen ions out of the working cells, out of the working fibers throughout your body Actually, your leg muscles, the other muscles of your body, can be trained to, you know, lactate is a metabolic fuel that can be used by slow twitch fibers. So the lactate that you're making in your forearms, if you can keep the blood flowing, and if you can shake out frequently, you get that lactate out of your forearm muscles, and it can be used for fuel in your slow twitch fibers throughout your body. It can even circulate back to your liver and be converted back into, uh, glycogen in your liver. It can circulate to your brain and be used as fuel. 
So lactate's not a bad thing. When you hear people dissing lactate, it's a metabolic byproduct of the anaerobic energy system, but it can be used as fuel for the aerobic energy system as long as you get it out of the, the muscle that's making it. Uh, you want to circulate it around your body. And so that's the value of being able to keep blood flowing, have a nice strong heart to pump blood throughout your body. Now, the hydrogen ions need to be buffered. They will be buffered inside the cell. Some of them will be transported outside the cell and be buffered in the blood by bicarbonate. But your brain will really quickly shut you down if your pH changes even slightly outside of the muscle cell. And so, again, that's where you need some local adaptations to help um, improve your buffering. And so, long story short, if you're climbing submaximally, that three-minute on, three-minute off protocol is a good one. In fact, I, I do two on, two off at home uh, on the tread wall, and I keep the intensity, you know, between six and six and eight. And I will do, if I'm in a good training block, up to 10 sets of that. Um, so two on, two off, two on, two off, uh, times 10. So that's 20 minutes of climbing and 20 minutes of resting. Or what I do at home oftentimes is, because I have a tread wall and a rowing machine, I'll do uh, two minutes on the tread wall, then I'll do two minutes on the rowing machine. And the two minutes on the rowing machine is basically me pulling at a five out of 10 intensity. And of course, if you've ever done rowing, you know that it works pretty much every muscle in your body, your legs, your you know, hip extensors, you know, your, your back, your core, just everything's working. And to a small degree, you're even your grip. And so it's really good for circulating blood throughout your body. Um, it's really a way to get that lactate cleared out of the climbing muscles and used by the other muscles. Uh, you might even call it active recovery. Um, and so I go two minutes of submaximal climbing on the tread wall, two minutes of very moderate rowing on the machine, and then back to the tread wall, and I go back and forth. So I actually, if I do that 10 times, I get 40 minutes um, with my heart rate at about 135 uh, beats per minute, which for an older person is a, you know, I don't know, 80% heart rate. Um, so it's kind of like a uh, equivalent of almost going on a, zone two run, or maybe zone two slash zone three run, uh, you know, where I'm getting good cardiovascular adaptations plus the local adaptations that I get um, in terms of the oxidative energy system, mitochondria, you know, um, improving mitochondria density, the improvement of, you know, capillary, uh, you know, density, um, and then, again, the systemic adaptations that I get from doing that type of protocol. So if you're doing three on, three off, that's fine, but I would probably guess your climbing intervals are more exhaustive, um, more in the eight or nine out of 10 range. And if so, they're more lactic. And if that's the case, then you want to have more rest and only do about four sets. So there's a long answer to <laughs> a short question. Um, Okay, um, let's move on here. Um, oh, thanks, Darko. Appreciate the congrats there. <laughs> um, okay, uh, is mixing max hangs with um, mall, I think, is minimum. I, I forget what mall is. Ma maximum. Uh, this is, I think, Ava Lopez. Um, minimum edge versus maximum weight, I guess, is what you're getting at here. The Ava Lopez uh, nomenclature. Um, so he's talking about mixing six sets of maximum weight with three sets of, of uh, minimum edge hangs. Um, and so um, they are both strategies for training um, maximum grip strength, where you're doing weighted hangs on a little larger edge, maybe like on a 14 millimeter or 20 millimeter edge, uh, and then without weight, doing body weight hangs on a small edge, maybe eight millimeters or six millimeters. Um, and there's different protocols you can use. It could be you know, um, a 10 second hang with a three minute rest, 
or it could be my seven second hang, 53 second rest uh, protocol. But um, I don't see a problem with mixing them. In fact, what I would probably consider doing is doing um, you know, uh, two sets of the weighted hangs and then a set of the body weight minimum edge hangs, then back to two sets of the weighted hangs and one set of the minimum edge hangs and then back to the two sets of weighted hangs and one set of minimum edge hangs. And so you're almost getting from the weighted hangs, you're getting this potentiation, you know, turning on the nervous system, the recruitment, and then you lose the weights and you do that minimum edge hang and you're actually going to probably feel stronger than you would feel if you hadn't done the weighted hangs first. And so that would be kind of a complex, uh, it's not for everybody, that would be quite a, of an advanced protocol, but um, it is something that I've uh, used and programmed in the past. Uh, just don't get too excessive. You know, as with any, you know, max strength type of uh, exercise or protocol, it only takes a small dose to get you the adaptations. And, uh, you know, this type of training is hard in your connective tissues. And so you want to use good technique with your grip and your shoulders uh, engaged um, and you, you want to keep the sets appropriate for your training history um, and, uh, you know, not do anything to tempt injury. Like this type of thing would be at most done twice a week. Okay, um, Jonathan says, uh, I believe in your last episode you mentioned you had shoulder surgery for um, AC decompression and had some... Uh, the same procedure, and I'm wondering how long it took you to recover. Yeah, I had my shoulder cleaned up. You know, old guy stuff. Um, uh, you know, life is hard on shoulders of men, even if you don't climb. In fact, you know, there's some evidence or research that has shown that, you know, if you just pull a 50-year-old guy off the streets and give him a shoulder arthrogram, you're going to find they have shoulder damage. You know, torn labrum, something that happened when they were a teenager or in their 20s, or something that happened through their life. Um, you know, uh, doing labor, manual labor, landscaping, cutting trees, you know, guy stuff. Um, or climbing, which is potentially hard on the shoulders, especially if uh, you have, uh, you know, hypermobile shoulder, shoulders, if you subject yourself to dangerous training practices and body positions and climbing and bouldering. You know, uh, climbers, I think if you pulled 50-year-old climbers uh, off the crag and check their shoulders, you'd find far more than 50% have uh, damaged shoulders. Uh, maybe the, the vast majority would. And I'm one of them, you know, after climbing all these years and being in my upper 50s. So, you know, there are some calcium deposits, you know, they can uh, shave those down and, uh, you know, some frayed tendons that they can clean up. Uh, you know, the fraying isn't gonna fix itself. And if there's ever diseased, you know, collagen, you know, disease meaning poorly healed uh, or failed healing, whether it's in an elbow tendon or a shoulder, you know, they can go in and kind of just, you know, on a very slight scale, remove that and it will actually spur on healing. Um, and so a good surgeon can clean you up and examine the labrum and, you know, decide if there's something there that needs attended to as well. And, you know, so for me, it was not like a major shoulder surgery where I was out for like a season or anything crazy like that. Um, but I think, um, you know, I did rehab for 10 weeks, something like that, and uh, returned to big hold climbing um, uh, at around 10 weeks. And uh, I think, you know, getting back to projecting 513 was something I did not want to rush back into. You know, perhaps it was five or six months until I did that, but perhaps a younger person, you know, could do it sooner. And, you know, every, every time a, a surgeon goes in, you know, it, it, everybody's a little different, you know, in terms of what the procedure is and how fast you can come back from it. Um, I've heard anecdotally, you know, I mean, it, you know, I have a lot of surgeon friends uh, that work on climbers and, um, you know, they have done with pro climbers that are 30 years old, you know, full, shoulder repairs and not all of them return to a top level but some of them you know many have and some quickly 
um, in you know three to six months uh, have returned. Uh, and, and so again, uh, some of it is you know the skill of the surgeon. Some of it is you know your injury history and genetics uh, and nutritional practices and you know there's there are a lot of factors you know so there is no hard and fast uh, answer but if if you had a similar procedure to me I would think you could be back doing very easy climbing by ten weeks and doing hard climbing by you know four to six months perhaps so okay uh, next up is uh, my friend, no rest days. Hey there. Um, Gunter, um, we do your hypergravity training on hard vertical sport routes with weight vest. What do you think about this? Okay, so, you know, I, decades ago, 25 years ago, kind of began using the term hypergravity training uh, for, you know, kind of classifying any training you do with extra weight added to your body. Uh, you know, for me, it's usually a weight belt anywhere from five pounds to a 20 pound weight belt. Uh, I like to have the weight you know, near your belly button, either a, a vest that has the weight kind of down near your pecs or a belt near your center of gravity so that when you're climbing, it doesn't really affect your center of gravity positioning so much. You don't want it to throw off your technique. You want it to be climbing naturally, but with weight added, simulating an enhanced pool of gravity. And it is a very effective training method, not a beginner strategy by any stretch, but it is a very effective training method. Um, and by the way, I have a 60 pound weight vest that I used for years to do weighted pull-ups. I didn't climb in it because you would never want to climb with 60 pounds in your body. I, I don't advocate that. That's not a natural thing to do. Um, but uh, for weighted pull-ups now, I prefer just hanging weight from like the blade, blade loop of my harness with a loading pin. Uh, you can just stack weight plates on a loading pin, clip it into your blade loop and do weighted pull-ups uh, or weighted hangs. But for climbing, uh, which is his question, he's saying about adding weight with a belt or a vest. Um, and I'm not a big fan of doing it on vertical um, because you know if, if you're on vertical wall climbing with good technique, more of the weight is on your feet than on your hands to begin with. So you know, if you add 10 pounds of weight on, more than half of that is on your feet. Uh, and so, you know, you're adding, you would need to add a lot of weight uh, to be impactful. And, you know, it just doesn't make sense uh, to me. Um, I think the better use of adding weight is on a, a bouldering wall or a tread wall, uh, where like a spray wall where you can do a circuit. Um, you could use it on a system wall, a kilter wall, tension board, moon board, whatever. You know, once you have those V2s or V4s wired, well, you put on a five or 10 pound belt and they become harder and you have to do everything harder. You have to squeeze harder. Your core has to work harder. Your, you know, all your body positions, you need to lock in more tightly. That's great training. Um, and I'll, so I, I, don't, I don't think enough climbers uh, utilize this technique. Um, now again, it's not appropriate. If you're new to climbing, if you've only been climbing a few years, if you have any recent injury of the fingers, elbows, shoulders, forget the, the hypergravity training, the, the added weight. Um, but if you're a healthy climber with several years experience, maybe someone who's beginning to experience a bit of a plateau, uh, doing some weighted bouldering uh, can be game changing. Uh, and so my preference is staying close to the ground where you can just step off the wall. Uh, you know, if you have 10 or 20 pounds extra on, you wouldn't want to take uncontrolled fall onto an arm or something crazy like that. So like, you know, a tread wall, a spray wall where you can, where you're always just a step away from the ground would be ideal. Um, if you're going to get on a rope, um, I, I guess a slightly overhanging top rope would be a, a safe thing to do. Um, I've never done lead climbing with a weight belt on. Just, it's not the mindset. You know, when I tie into a rope and go on the sharp end, uh, I'm, you know, tend to be on a mission to climb efficiently uh, or to red point a route. Um, and, uh, and just taking lead falls with extra weight, it just 
it doesn't seem like a good thing. So if you're going to get on routes, I would pick a slightly overhanging route as opposed to a vertical because you go to 10 or 15 degrees past a vertical. Now you have more weight on your hands than you do your feet and the, the added weight starts to mean more. Uh, but again, I think the main use of wearing a five or 10 or at most 20 pound weight belt would be on a bouldering wall, a system wall, or a spray wall. And again, when you're wearing the weight, then you're more training the alactic system. Like if you're doing boulder problems with a weight belt, you know, three to six move boulder problems, well then that's very alactic, you know, max strength, max power, lock off kind of stuff. Uh, and if you're doing circuits, like if you did a two minute circuit on a spray wall with say just a five or 10 pound belt, that would be very lactic. Um, it wouldn't make sense to wear a weight belt and try to do a submaximal uh, aerobic set. That I would not recommend. So again, it's not something you do every workout because you don't want to train the lactic system uh, nor the alactic system every workout. You know, you want to, you know, climbing is a sport that demands comprehensive development of all three energy systems. And so that's part of the art of exercise prescription and design. Okay, let's blast through a few more questions here and we'll wrap this up. Um, okay, uh, he says, able to climb outside the whole winter in Berlin. Well, that surprises me. I always thought of Berlin as being a cold place. Um, uh, but that's, that's good to know. <laughs> I guess maybe like any mid-latitude location, there can be some warm days uh, scattered throughout the winter. So, um, Next question. Uh, I've been trying to improve my two-finger pockets. My current hangboard is Max Hangs. Um, half crimp, three-finger drag. I can hold 30 pounds. How do I transition to pockets right now? Yeah, you know, the pocket grip is... Um, uh, for some climbers, very intuitive, and for other climbers, uh, very difficult to learn. Um, you know, some people, I think a lot of it is architecture of the fingers um, and the strength of their wrist muscles. And, you know, they come into climbing and they become natural crimpers. Uh, and if you're someone who learned to climb, that's how I learned to climb, you know, as a trad climber eons ago, climbing mostly vertical things and crimping. Um, to learn uh, in modern sport climbing to grab pockets, you know, these open-handed pockets was very, very different. And so, you know, on a hangboard, um, you need, that's a, a great way to train these things is on a hangboard. And I think the key to moving into that is to do them at less than body weight. So, you know, you might feel comfortable hangboarding on like half crimps or open crimps or whatnot at body weight on certain holds, but you, you try the pockets um, and you don't feel comfortable, maybe it feels injurious. Um, and so that's where if your hangboard is at a proper level, you can kind of drag your toes in the ground um, and hang on the pockets and just pull enough weight off of your toes uh, until it feels hard but not dangerous. Um, and so maybe you're pulling 60 or 70% of your body weight, but your toes are holding the, the remainder. Um, and you can just do internet, uh, um, you know, intervals, uh, intermittent intervals in that way um, and work all the different grips. You know, you mentioned three finger drag, but you can also drag these three. You can work all the different, you know, teams of two finger pockets and even start to circulate into one finger pockets. Um, you know, a board like the Beastmaker 2000 is a good board because it has holds uh, it's got a good, you know, first pad two finger pocket that you could drag your toes on the ground, or you could use a pulley counterweight system to take weight off, and you could it could be more measurable that way. You could start with having the counterweight system take off, you know, a third of your body weight, and then over time reduce the counterweight uh, and eventually build to body weight. Uh, and you know, training that two three days a week, um, you know, will uh, provide you know, the neuromuscular adaptations, you know, kind of there's always some motor learning involved in exercise training, even though you don't think of hanging pockets as a skill, uh, there's still motor learning involved and just how everything's being recruited through your upper body 
to allow you to stick those pockets. Uh, the, the tenon uh, pulleys are being loaded in a, a little different way than when you're crimping. Uh, they will adapt. Uh, the lumbrical muscles in your palms will adapt as you go into different two finger teams and even you know one fingers, which you wanna be very careful easing into one finger pockets. Um, you can get little lumbrical muscle injuries in your palm if you're not careful. Do a lot of stretching, a lot of warming up before you uh, do the pocket hangs. Uh, and then try to take those pocket positions onto a climbing wall and start to, on a spray wall, grab some pockets with your feet on, of course, at, you know, so you're less than body weight. Um, and over the course of months and even years, you will get stronger and more confident in those pockets. But it's got to be a slow process. You need to really be disciplined not to escalate things. That's a big mistake that many climbers make. You know, they get a new hangboard, they build a bouldering wall, they get a tread wall, and it's like all in, more is better. And when it comes to training for climbing, you know, more is generally not better. So, um, you know, more can be injurious. So um, hopefully that helps you out a little bit there. Um, Okay, and uh, yeah, I tried my best on your answer there, so hopefully that helped you out. It all comes down to intensity. You know, that's something that I, I just, I, I know I'm repetitive and redundant. If you have read my books and listened to my podcasts and, you know, these videos, um, I'm very much a believer that, you know, training for climbing is one of the most com you know, complex things you can do in terms of sports training because, you know, there's so many facets to what we do. You know, the mental game, the technical game, you know, flexibility, mobility, you know, movement, um, and then of course, strength and power and endurance and aerobic endurance and recovery ability is massively overlooked by a lot of climbers, actually training in ways that enhances recovery, um, and then diet and nutrition and rest and recovery. And then to dial that all in onto a calendar and then to execute and follow through, and then to make adjustments based on how you feel on any given day, auto-regulation of your training, so that it is a, the appropriate workout for who you are that day. Um, you know, and if you wake up sore and tired, you shouldn't probably do the workout you planned. You should probably do something a little different or maybe even take the day off. And you know, that's the art of training for climbing, something I've spent decades um, learning to do. And there's other expert coaches out there who have been doing it for decades as well. You know, in Germany, there's the Cafe Kraft guys, uh, Dickie and Patrick, and of course, Udo. And, um, you know, here in the United States, a number of coaches have been doing it for a year, like Robin Urbisfeld, who's probably put more youth climbers into the World Cups than any other coach at this point. Um, though other coaches, like the, the coach in Japan and Slovenia and, you know, Orr's, uh, stalker and you know the, the you know there's more and more coaches that really get it and understand the value of nuance and the idea that you can't just take a cookie cutter program and give it to climbers that might work for a beginner but if you're more than a beginner you need nuance that is maybe something you can suss out your on yourself through education um, and kind of figure it out over the course of many years but also the guidance of a veteran coach it will be invaluable and help you get from here to there faster. And so uh, that is kind of the goal of Training Cafe is to help you do that um, and it's free of charge. The only requirement is that you sip coffee or your favorite beverage with me. And uh, so we shall do that and sign off. Thank you, dear climbing friend from uh, or for tuning in. Uh, I hope you really enjoyed this if you did. Uh, check out my latest Training for Climbing podcast. I it posted last Monday or Tuesday. It talks about whether running is a good thing for climbing. And there's a lot of misinformation or misapplied information out there on that topic. So check out that Training for Climbing podcast. Um, and it might uh, you know, teach you a thing or two about uh, you know, the evidence-based you know, reasons to actually do a bit of running for climbing. It can help you out in multiple ways. Uh, and so I am a fan of that. You know, I just had um, a, a friend here, uh, you might have heard of him, Alex Megos was here at the Red with me uh, last week. And, uh, 
you know, he is an avid runner. You know, no, he's not running marathons. He's not running races, but um, he uh, goes for a run about every other day. And, and even um, the morning of his flight home, he's like, well, I'm getting ready to sit on an airplane for the next eight hours. I'm going to go for a run. And so he was up at, you know, 7 a.m. going for a run in the rain. And <laughs> then he came home and changed clothes and got on an airplane back to Germany. And so, yeah, running is a good thing for many climbers. Maybe not for everybody, but uh, for most climbers, I think it's uh, a small piece of the puzzle that can be used to help enhance what uh, you're trying to do out there on the rocks. Okay, well, that's enough for this episode of the Training Cafe. Um, we'll see you in a few weeks. I can't say when, but it will be some Monday, um, probably in early April. And I hope to see you then. Have a good one.